And we are in week four of a, a brand new series uh, called Letters to the Seven Churches. And I just wanna start off by just praying real quickly here today. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Come and do what only you can do in this moment. Would you come and allow the scriptures to be illuminated in our hearts and minds so that it might pierce us, so that it might confront us. We give you permission to confront our brokenness, our despair, our idolatry, our agendas. We invite you to come and expose those things for what they are. And then Holy Spirit, comfort us with the good news of who Jesus really is and how he has made a way for all of us to be whole, to be restored, to experience resurrection life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we are in this fourth week of this series, the Letters to the Seven Churches, where we are really doing a deep dive study in the book of Revelation, the first three chapters, to try and journey together in discovering how we can receive the blessing that is found in the reading, but also the understanding of this book that speaks to the end, but it speaks to the end by speaking to the past, the present, and the future. And we've been reiterating that point over and over again that the final book of the Bible does speak to the end, but it speaks to the end by speaking past, present, and future, and that when we read this book, when we hear this book read, and then when we gain an understanding of this book, it gives us a great blessing. Now, I want to remind us that as we study this series together, if we do not come away from our readings with a high view of Jesus, as he is, as he has always been, and forever will be, if we do not come away with that view and we come away more consumed by Satan and his minions and how they inflict harm on God's people, often through the empires and the systems of governance in the world, then we've read the book wrongly. Our study of this book should lead us towards a victorious eschatology. And that word simply means final things or end times. Our study of this book must lead us towards a victorious end time view. Rather than an eschatology that re-empowers Satan, who has been defeated and is continuing to be defeated. Satan has been defeated and is continuing to be defeated. And so this book should paint that picture for us. I said in week one, this book should give us a high Christology, not a high Satanology. And so that's been our attempt, that's been our journey, is to always be Christocentric, to be Christ-centered, center of it all in our reading and understanding of this book. Now you remember from week one that I talked about how this book has many different contrasts all throughout it, throughout it, opposing things and opposite things and things that just parallel at times. But then there's all these different contrasts. And so uh, one of the contrasts that we see in this book is that of what's called Team Lamb, which wins, and Team Dragon, which loses. Now I know uh, for our Chinese brothers and sisters, it's the year of the dragon. This is something completely different, all right? So I had a gentleman in our first service, he said, I'm, I'm born in the year of the dragon. My daughter is born in the year of the lamb. Uh, so she's the winner and I'm the loser, right? And I, I said, well, sort of, <laughs> all right? Um, so Team Lamb, which wins because uh, Team Lamb has already won. Team Lamb has already won based off of the events that happened 2,000 years ago with what Christ accomplished at the cross. And Team Dragon, which is Satan, which loses because Team Dragon has already lost. He is a defeated foe. His days are numbered. And the spirit of this age is in fact coming to an end. And so as a coach, a former coach, I had to bring in some team dynamics because there's some important football games happening today. Uh, Lord, be with our Detroit Lions. Let them win in Jesus' name because Detroit needs us. Detroit, Detroit needs us. Have you seen the Pistons this year? Detroit needs us, all right? So don't throw rakes, rocks at me for that, but uh, all right. So Team Lamb wins, Team Dragon loses. Now, Michael Gorman, in his uh, commentary on the book of Revelation, it's called Reading Revelation Responsibly, he says this, it is the task of Revelation in part to convince its hearers and readers that faithful discipleship has both cost and rewards. 
That is why the seven messages contain both words of challenge and promises. And so over the last couple of weeks, we've been in chapter two of this book and looking at these prophetic oracles, these prophetic letters that Jesus is wanting to speak to these different churches, seven churches that are seven literal churches in literal cities with literal people and how he wants to speak to them to build them up in their faith, but also confront some things in their midst. But we also believe that because these letters are prophetic oracles, that they also speak prophetically to us today. That there are timeless messages in these letters that we as the Church of Canada can hear and respond in obedience to. So I want us to stand for the reading of God's word. And this morning we're gonna be looking at the church at Smyrna, uh, Izmir, modern day Turkey, this church is located in. In Revelation chapter two, verses eight through 11, and it says this. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last, who was dead and has come to life, says this. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death. And I will help here. Give us a moment. Glenn, no, take a seat, you're fine. You wanna take a seat, Glenn? Take a seat. Thank you, so Glenn, hey. Let's get some helpers here. Let's go out to the lobby. I, I, I think you just passed. Diane, can we? You might have passed out, buddy. All right, let's take you out to the lobby. Make sure you're okay. Thank you, team. Appreciate it. So, Lord, we pray for our brother Glenn right now. And we pray that whatever just happened in him, Lord, we pray for your healing power to touch him, for your healing power to be with them. And Lord, that you would just give him peace, give him comfort, and that he would get the right help that he needs in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, I think I was in verse 10. Are you still with me? All right, let's go. All right, verse 10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you'll be tested. You'll have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The one who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. This is the word of the Lord. We may be seated. So starting off in this this letter, in this prophetic oracle, verse eight, it says, and to the angel of the church at Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says, this. Now, when you do a little bit of historical study of this city, what you'll see is that Smyrna was founded as a Greek colony about 1,000 years before Christ came. Smyrna was also a city that was captured and destroyed a few times, but then had this way of rising from the ashes, resurrecting itself, and becoming a city of great prominence again. Smyrna was known as a city to have a fierce loyalty to Rome and was the first city to build a temple to Caesar Augustus in AD 23. In fact, it's known that the city of Smyrna lived by the slogan, Rome first in all things. This was kind of the thing that they championed themselves on, that they were allegiant to the empire and they believed that Rome was the all-powerful one and they were to live in such a way where they were to live for the glory of Rome, and the city became known as the crown of Asia. Now, what I love is that as we read this letter, and we see this all throughout these letters, we see that Jesus knows this about Smyrna, not just because he is all-knowing, looking down from heaven to the world, because as we looked at the last couple of weeks, we must remember that John sees him as one who is actually present amongst his churches. 
Jesus knows Smyrna, not because he's all-knowing up in heaven looking down on them, but Jesus is all-knowing and knows Smyrna and how to communicate to them because he is present in their midst. And we looked at that over the last couple of weeks, how, how John sees one like the Son of Man who is amongst the lampstands that is able to speak the prophetic word of the Lord to these people. And so Jesus, he communicates to them with the cultural understanding that they have to reveal who he is by speaking to them as the true first and the last. You see, Smyrna prided itself as being the first city that built the temple. He speaks to them as one who was dead, but now is alive. In the same way that Smyrna had been overtaken and overthrown and considered abolished and then had this way of coming back to life and resurrecting, Jesus is now speaking to them as one who was dead, but is now alive. And he's speaking to them as one who is the true crown of heaven. And this one wants to speak to them about where their loyalty and their allegiance must lie despite what challenges may come. I love this, that we worship Jesus who knows how to communicate to his people. He knows how to communicate to people in a way that they can comprehend and understand. And we must understand that the church of Smyrna, when they heard this letter read aloud, and they hear this language of the first and the last and the crown of heaven and the one who was dead and is alive, they would have said, wait a second, that, that's kind of like our story. And this is how Jesus brings them in. He pulls them in to say, yeah, it's kind of like your story, but I'm the truer form of that story. And this is important, and whenever it comes to witness and gospel proclamation, is that we look within culture, and we find things within culture that we can say there is a right heart in the pursuit of what you're after, though you may be pursuing it with the wrong methods. And this is what Jesus does to this church. He says, yeah, in the same way that this is your story, let me tell you, I'm the truer form of that story. And I am the true eternal one. I am the first and I am the last. I am the one who is dead and is now alive. And I wanna speak some things to you about encouragement in the midst of whatever you face. First nine, he says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the slander by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now this word tribulation in the Greek, philipsis, it speaks of pressure or crushing pressure. And in the first century context, it would conjure up ideas of slow and dragged out torture. Jesus speaks to them. He says, I know you because I'm amongst you. And I see your pressure. I see your tribulation. I see that things are being cranked up in your life. And then he goes on and he speaks of this idea of slander, which speaks of false accusation or cunning words or lies or even verbally abusing or mocking someone. How many people like being falsely accused? Can I see that hand? No hands? All right. None of us like being falsely accused. None of us like being slandered. None of us like being misunderstood. One of my greatest fears, even as a leader at times, is simply being misunderstood. And so Jesus, he speaks to this church and he says, I see the pressure that you are enduring. I see the challenge that you're going through. And I see how people are speaking ill of you. The phrase synagogue of Satan was not meant to be some sort of anti-Semitic accusation as both Jesus and John are Jews themselves, but it rather speaks to a situation that was happening in Smyrna where many Jews and Judaism itself have been accepted by Rome as one of the ways to worship. Rome was very pluralistic in its embrace of spirituality and religions, but what they didn't want was one religion saying this is the true way. And so they would say, you're, you're open to worship how you want, but then be open to the other types of worship. And in fact, maybe embrace some of them, but then when it comes to ultimate worship, we need to give our worship to Rome. We need to give our worship to the empire. And so many of the Jews of that day began to compromise uh, in, in how they interacted with Rome. And so the Christians were actually seen as agitators. In the early years, the Christians were kind of brought in under the, the umbrella of Judaism. And so they're considered one. 
And then over time, the, uh, Judaism wanted to separate itself from Christianity because the Christians were resilient in their declaration that no, Caesar is not Lord, Jesus is Lord. And though Judaism worshiped one God, they were, they were finding themselves compromising in all these other areas. And so the Christians were agitators. They were a threat to Rome. In fact, they were actually called atheists because they worshiped one God and not a plurality of God. And this was happening especially in Smyrna. And many of the Jews in Smyrna would speak ill and accuse Christians of all kinds of things, often based off of bogus claims and they were known for turning the Christians over to Roman authorities. Now, when it comes to this idea of tribulation, I, I wanna say this because I think sometimes in North American Western culture, we can have easily warped ideas of what tribulation is. Not every inconvenience that we experience is persecution. I'll try this side. Not every inconvenience is persecution. And it's important for us to understand that. Because when we take on sometimes a martyrdom complex in the West and treat every annoyance or inconvenience as persecution, I believe it's a slap in the face of much of the persecuted church around the globe that is experiencing real persecution, and I've been there. I've worked with the underground church in China. I know what they face and endure on a regular basis. However, in saying that, sometimes on the opposite end as Canadians, we wanna bury our head in the sand and act like the pressure is not increasing. We wanna say, well, everything's fine, nothing's really bad and it's all okay. Meanwhile, there is this thalipsis, this pressure that is in fact increasing. And how it often manifests in Western cultures is through this form of slander. Where even now in our world for simply holding to orthodox views of the Christian faith that have been held for 2000 plus years, false accusations, misunderstandings, slanders towards the Christian community happen even here in Canada. I'm not willing to say it's persecution, but let's not ignore that it is pressure. And there's even more pressure coming out in the next couple of months on some things about asking the church to do certain things or align with certain things that as a Bible convicted Christian, we just can't align with. And so there is this realm that, that, that pressure is increasing. And so the idea is that suffering, philipsis, pressure, tribulation is in fact inevitable for those that follow Jesus. Now, when you study the book of Revelation, I, I talked about this in week one, there have been several different views of how to understand this book throughout church history. And one of those views is this view called futurism. And futurism, it sees this idea of tribulation as, uh, it sees tribulation and persecution as something that can take place in part right now in the church age, but believes in a futuristic great tribulation that will take place immediately before the second coming of Christ. So there is tribulation now and persecution now, but there's a day of this great tribulation that will happen before the time of the second coming of Christ. And futurists usually see the, the, the weeks of Daniel, Daniel 9, the 70 weeks is being connected to trying to figure out are we in the 70th week or, or not. Now within this view, there are two versions of this view. Are you with me? All right, the first version is what's called dispensational futurism. And dispensational futurism is the most popular view in North American culture. It's the most recent view in understanding this book. And it believes that the church will be raptured out of the earth either before or midway through the great and final tribulation. So when it comes to that great final tribulation, dispensationalism says we will be raptured out of the earth and essentially we will escape that great tribulation. The historical view of futurism that can be traced all the way back to the first century uh, believes that the church will endure through and will be preserved within the great and final tribulation and then the rapture of the church will happen. That is the historical view. So sometimes it gets framed in what's called pre-trib rapture, post-trib rapture. Anybody ever heard these terms? All right, so that, that's the way it gets presented. In the view called preterism, Stay with me. It sees tribulation or great tribulation as being connected to the rise of persecution in the latter first century, 
ultimately culminating in the destruction of the second temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. And so a common phrase with preterists is, the last days are the past days. The worst of the worst is behind us. Things will progressively move forward. That's the preterist view. And that has shaped a lot of exploration for countries and nations. America was actually founded upon this type of view, though they wouldn't call it that, but it was post-millennial, is that the nations will become Christianized as the gospel goes forward and things will get progressively better. This led into what's called manifest destiny in America's history. And so the worst days are behind us. Things will progressively get better. Idealism sees tribulation as just a normative experience for the church throughout the ages because of the tension of the kingdom of God breaking into the hostility and opposition of the age. And some idealists would say that there may be a final tribulation before the second coming of Christ, but there really isn't any way of knowing whether it's a great and final tribulation. Now, as I said in week one, we need to be careful ever to force our reading of this book into any of these views. We should rather take an open, eclectic view and say where the book is speaking about tribulation that is to come, let the Bible speak for itself. Where the book is speaking about persecution and tribulation of that day, let the Bible speak for itself. Where the book is uh, uh, clearly using language that speaks of the church age and the idea of pressure and suffering and tribulation being the norm, let the text speak for itself. Because when we go on to verse 10 of this letter, we see this. The words are simply this. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you'll be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto what? Death. And I will give you the crown of life. You see, the question for every follower of Jesus in this room here this morning and throughout history is not, will you suffer? Will you experience pressure? Will you even experience tribulation? But rather, the question is, when you suffer, how do you respond? No matter what view you take on how to read this book, the question that is clearly conveyed in here is the idea is that as a follower of Jesus, it doesn't mean that your life will be easy. You will have to go through some stuff. You will have to endure in the midst of stuff. You will experience pressure and how will you respond? And the encouragement given from Jesus himself, the one who is in the center of the church, is do not fear but posture your heart in that of faith, which is connected to faithfulness, even in the midst of this great pressure. When you suffer, will you throw in the flag of defeat? Or when you suffer, will you rise with a tenacious, resilient faith and be faithful to the allegiance of Team Lamb, even if it means it might cost you your life? Now, when he talks about 10 days of testing, some scholars say it's not necessarily meant to mean 10 literal days, uh, but spoke about the idea of humanity's complete effort in testing, the idea of 10 fingers and 10 uh, toes and uh, human efforts, hands and feet, uh, being involved in this testing. Some scholars say it's speaking to a short and measured time that will come to an end. But probably more importantly, as is consistent with the book of Revelation, is this language alludes to Daniel chapter one, verses 12 through 15, where Daniel and his friends are tested and tempted for 10 days so as to try to convince them to give in to the Babylonian empire and all it has to offer. Remember from our series on Daniel, the uh, resilient faith and how Daniel and his companions are taken into slavery out of Jerusalem, Judea, and they're brought into, into Babylon. And as they're brought into Babylon, the king tries to offer them all that Babylon has to offer them to get their hearts aligning more with the empire of Babylon rather than the city of God, Jerusalem. And so in Daniel 1, we see this. At first, there is this offer of the king's choice 
food. Babylon is saying, you can experience so much pleasure if you just give your allegiance to us. And he offers them this, this great food. So I'm thinking like T-bone steaks and ribeyes and stuff like that. And, you know, just the greatest of the great kind of food. He's offering them to uh, this food and he's saying, I have so much pleasure for you to experience if you just give your heart and allegiance to us. Secondly, we see that the food was sacrificed to idols. We spoke of compromise. Would they be willing to not necessarily throw out all of their religion, but just add some spiritualism and some other religions and pagan ideas to their faith? and compromise their faith for the sake of the Babylonian empire. Thirdly, it's the idea they were invited to eat at the king's table, which speaks of, of their allegiance, where they just allow themselves to be recognized as Babylonians. And so for 10 days, Daniel and his friends are tempted to give in to these things. I would actually propose these temptations are at work in every single world government and empire, even here today that there is this constant challenge that is lobbying for the people of God just to give in, just to align our hearts with the governance of the world over Team Lamb. And it comes through the enticement of pleasure and, and compromise and just a little bit of your heart, a little bit of your allegiance. And so the word of the Lord comes to these Christians at Smyrna and it says, you will be tested for 10 days. In the same way that Daniel and his friends were tested, you will be tested. Don't give in. Do not fear. Respond in faith, even if it costs you your life. You see, the temptation to give in to the enticements of the empire are connected to whether these believers and really followers of Jesus in every age is connected to whether they pass the test or not. But the challenge is that passing the test may not lead to what these believers are hoping for. Passing the test may cost them their lives. In fact, the prophetic word of the Lord for these believers is that passing the test may still involve being killed for their faith but there is a promise that is given in verses 10 and 11 of a higher reward that followers of Jesus are ultimately living for. Something that not even death itself can take from us. You will be tested. You will be tempted. Guard your heart. Do not fear. Remain faithful in the testing and understand that you are living for a reward that no empire can offer you. You are living for a reward, for a promise that no government system of the world can give you. Do you believe it? Do you hope in it? Do you trust it? Are you willing to live this out even when it costs you your very life? You see, they can kill the body, but they can't kill the soul. They can take your physical well-being, but they can't take that which is eternal and within you. And this is what the word is coming to this church of Smyrna for. G.K. Beale says, it is only enduring faith that guarantees identification with Christ and hence participation in his eternal resurrection life. See, verse 11 says, the one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And the one who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. These are consistent with the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, where he says, do not be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. This is consistent with the words of Jesus in John chapter 11 where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will what? Live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says, death is the ultimate weapon of the tyrant. Resurrection does not make a covenant with death. It overthrows it. Death is the way of the world and sin and brokenness and the way of the empire and the tyrant. Resurrection, eternal life, is the way of the kingdom. And when we understand that we belong to Team Lamb, it helps us to live the victorious life 
even when it involves death, even when it involves physical harm, because they can take this body, but they can't take our soul. But what reward are we living for if we're consumed with the empire's pleasures and the empire's compromise and the empire's allegiance? Christianity sounds like bad news. But if we're consumed with team lamb and the way of the kingdom and an eternal reward that we are promised, Christianity sounds like great, amazing news. You see, the reward of resurrection is not like many Western thinkers think of life after death. This idea that we're dead, somehow we come back to life, but only to die again like Lazarus or others, right? In first century Judaism, the idea of resurrection was you were dead, brought back to life, never to die again. It's the complete conquering of death. It's the complete obliteration and destruction of the fear of death. This is why the apostle Paul could say, oh, death, where is your sting? It's been swallowed up in victory because of what Christ has done. This is the reward. This is the promise that is offered to the church of Smyrna, but it's also offered to Glad Tidings Pentecostal Church in Burlington, Ontario today, that we are living for something different. We're living for something that is eternal, that no matter what philipsis, no matter what pressure we face in this world, we're living for a different world. We're living for a new world. We're living for a restored world. We're living for eternity. And when we capture that, when we capture that, that's when you begin to experience the victorious life. Too many times we as Christians try to correlate the things of the world to the things of the kingdom. Thinking that the good life, the Christian life, is all about the things of this world. It's not. It's not. And if you think that's the thing that will bring you delight and satisfaction, you will be let down every single time. Death is the ultimate weapon of the tyrant. Resurrection does not make a covenant with death. It overthrows it. In the first couple centuries, there was a group of leaders that rose up in the church called the Early Church Fathers. One of the early ones was a church father by the name of Polycarp. Anybody ever heard of Polycarp before in your study of church history? He lived between 69 to 156 AD. He actually became the bishop of Smyrna. It's believed by church history that he was a student of the apostle John, and he would have known and understood this letter written to the people that he has given leadership over. Polycarp did an incredible job raising up a healthy vibrant church in Smyrna, despite all its persecution. Near the end of his life, as he was up in age, there was a great tribulation and persecution that began to arise. And many people in Smyrna were being arrested and then martyred because they were following Jesus, not declaring the emperor as Lord, but declaring Jesus as Lord. And so the persecutors began to pursue Polycarp. And several of the, the leaders in the church actually encouraged him. They said, Polycarp, you need to escape and get out of the city. But he wouldn't leave the city. He went into hiding. Finally, he was betrayed by some people who let, them know, let the Roman officials know where he was hiding out at. And they came to the place he was hiding out at, burst into the doors, and Polycarp was there with a meal prepared for his enemies. Come on. Hey, before you guys arrest me and take me off to the pro council, let's sit down and share some food together. We had to talk about the things of the gospel and Jesus and they put him in a carriage and began to take him away. And even in the carriage, some of the people there said, you're an elderly man, you're old in age. Well, just, just escape, just go, get out of the city. And he said, no, I'm, I'm supposed to go. So he went before the pro council. We actually have record of the interactions, the things that were said by some of the first I followers and kind of a, a moderate version of this, it says this, Polycarp was brought before the proconsul who tried to persuade him to deny the faith. Respect your age, he says. Swear by the divine power of Caesar. Change your mind. Say away with the atheists, the Christians. But Polycarp, with a solemn look at the unruly mob in the stadium, pointed to them, looking up to heaven and said, away with those atheists. The pro council urged him harder, take the oath, I will let you go. Curse Christ. Polycarp responded, 86 years I have served him. 
and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? When the proconsul kept insisting, swear by the divine power of Caesar, Polycarp answered, if you vainly suppose that I will swear by the divine power of Caesar, as you say, and if you pretend that you do not know who I am, listen plainly, I am a Christian. And if you wish to learn the Christian message, arrange a meeting and give me a hearing. Like even on his deathbed here, or his death threat of ending his life, he's like, how can I preach the gospel? Give me a hearing. Pro counsel went on and said, I have wild animals. I'll throw you to them unless you change your mind. Call them in, Polycarp replied, for we are not allowed to change from something better to something worse. Scorn the wild beasts and I'll have you burned alive if you don't change your mind. And Polycarp said, you threaten with fire that burns for a short time and is soon quenched. You don't know about the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment that awaits the wicked. But why are you waiting? Come, do what you will. They took him to the middle of the stadium and he felt like he heard the voice of God that said, Polycarp, be the man. Meaning stand strong in that first century context. And they went to tie him up against the post. He said, I don't need a post to help me stand. I'll stand in the midst of this. They tied his arms. They lit the fire. And according to eyewitnesses passed down to the church throughout history, it was like the, the fire wouldn't consume him. And so the, the Roman governors took a spear and pierced him. And so much blood began to pour out of his side, it actually quenched the little fire that was there. And he went on and died. Now, think about this. If the enemy was going to try to take out the church in Smyrna, of course he's going to go after the leader. If we can just take out Polycarp, the people will get scared. And they did it publicly on display. The church throughout Smyrna, modern day Turkey in this region, has only remained and remained strong. That even today, a couple thousand years later, there is a strong, vibrant, Orthodox church there with their allegiance to Team Lamb and not Team Dragon. You see, once again, they can kill the body, but they can't kill the soul. And so as we come to a close here this morning, I, I, hope, I hope this word builds up our faith. We may never face what Polycarp faced. We may not experience persecution in the way that other places of the world are experiencing, but we may. But even if we don't experience it on that realm in our lifetime, you will experience pressure. You will experience hardship. You will be slandered because of your faith. And so many times as Christians, we just wanna throw in the flag and say, it's too hard, it's too difficult. I'm just going to deconstruct my faith and join all the different thinkings of the world because then people will leave me alone. But the prophetic word of the Lord to the church of Smyrna, to us today, do not fear. In the midst of your philipsis, arise, be a person of faith, be a person of faithfulness, even if it means you lose your life for the cause of Christ. This speaking to any of us here this morning, even if it means you lose your life for the cause of Christ. Don't give in to Team Dragon. Keep your allegiance strong with Team Lamb. We'll stand to our feet. So once again, Team Lamb wins because it's already won. Team Dragon loses because it's already lost. My mentor used to always tell me this. He used to say, Tim, Jesus never promised it's going to be easy. Jesus only promised it's going to be worth it. And the reason it's worth it, not because of what you experience here. The reason it's worth it is because of what you experience of that eternal reward. But when we capture that eternal reward, it shapes us in the here. Once again, you begin to experience a victorious life. You can have all hell breaking loose and be a person of victory. You can be facing all kinds of hardship and turmoil and pressure and be a person full of joy and peace. Why? Because you're living for resurrection life. That is your promise, that is your reward. I'm gonna invite the prayer team to come to the front. In a moment when I'm done praying, if you're here, 
And maybe you're going through a season of pressure. Maybe it's your family. Sometimes family reunions, the negativity, the slander. Maybe it's your workplace where you feel like, man, I gotta be quiet about everything because people are always on edge with anything. We're not commissioning people to be jerks in any setting, but I am commissioning the church to be bold in every setting, to be courageous in every setting, to carry the spirit of peace wherever you go in wisdom and not be afraid to tell of your allegiance to Team Lamb because it is the hope of the world. So let me pray, and then if you want prayer, we would love the opportunity to pray with you. Lord, we speak blessing over your people here today. I pray that the word of the Lord would, would speak to us in the same way that it spoke to the church of Smyrna, let it speak to us. You see us because you're amongst us. And you see the, the hardship, the challenges that many people in this room are facing. It may not be persecution on some levels, but it's still pressure. It's still challenging. And you see them in the midst of that. And your word to them is that in the midst of this pressure, in the midst of this challenge, will they remain faithful to Team Lamb? Will they remain faithful to Jesus alone? That they, they would not give in to the temptations of the empire and the world. Help them to understand you're calling us to a, a greater reward, a greater cause, so that we might experience a true victorious life no matter what happens in these moments. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Blessings, go in the power and strength and goodness of his might, walk in his ways. We have a meet the lead team in the social center for those that are newer to GLAD and wanna meet some of the staff. Have an incredible week. If you want prayer, we would love the opportunity to pray with you. Thank you.